Hello, creative, and welcome back to the Empowered Creatives Podcast, finding confidence between hustle and burnout. I'm your host, Victoria Hines, creative career coach, helping creatives like you navigate your career hurdles. I'm really excited about my guest this week, and I've already introduced her once because Zoom is really hating me today. But this is a good friend of mine and my sales coach, Annie P. Ruggles. So are you strapped in? Here's how amazing she is. So for over a decade, she has harnessed her Hulk-like disdain for hard sales, tacky self-promotion, and overly competitive sleazeballs as inspiration to help people find better ways to grow their small business. As founder of the Non-Sleazy Sales Academy, she's guided hundreds of people towards making deeper connections, lasting impressions, and friendlier, more lucrative transactions and conversations. Her pride and joy is her podcast, too legitimate to quit, instantly actionable small business strategies with a pop culture spin. Did I get that right, Annie? Yeah, it was beautifully delivered. It's like you have a theater background or something. What? 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 Crazy. People with theater degrees wind up in communications? What? (laughs) I'm going to derail this for one second before I ask you my very prominent question. But every time I see a list of threes, I think back to my voice teacher who like told me, In order to, like, properly vocalize lists, you imagine your hands holding up the item at different levels. Oh, very Vanna White. Yes, but it helps your brain separate them and then make them distinct different things. And that's every single time. That's fantastic. (laughs) I'm, like, voguing now over here, listener. Like, this is, that's a revolutionary concept. Crazy. You learn something new every day, even from other people's strange, strange theatrical experiences. (laughs) And they get stranger, but you know, that's not the topic of this podcast. No. So, (laughs) all right, Annie, what do artists and creatives need to know is possible today? Artists and creatives need to know that it's possible to forgive yourself. Mm. In that... As we age, I see more and more of us creative types kind of pull away from voluntary drama, but that doesn't mean we've always made the best decisions, and that doesn't mean we've always treated ourselves well. And so what I see a lot in creative work among creative people is there's still not as much of the starving artist mentality, but still a lot of the tortured artist mentality is, you know, I have to suffer for my art. And if it's not demanding anything of me or, you know, I have to knock myself down so I'm in a place to create or I can't believe I missed that opportunity, this opportunity. I should have applied for that show. I should have gotten a corner table instead of a rotate. And there's just so much shooting that it keeps us questioning our abilities instead of helping us rise against that by honing craft. Mm, That lands really, really deeply home. And common example, I think with most theater people, like our body image is just complete. Oh, good. Crap. God. After being in the acting world. And I still to this day will say something and like somebody else will check me and I was like, yep, Okay, blame in theater. That's that's what did it to me. Yep. And also knowing the appropriate size to show up. Because there are times when, especially theater kids, we are supposed to be big in small spaces. There are times when we're too big for small spaces. And there are times when we're too small for big spaces. And times when we're too little, whatever, <laughs> right? There's always going to be this idea of artist versus world um, when you're creating. And sometimes you might not fit so well. And that doesn't mean you're doing it wrong. So to continue to beat yourself up over missteps or mistakes, or especially just if you just went out and tried something and fell on your face, failed forward, do not carry that resentment around with you. It's not, we are not Brontes. Depression and despair is not going to make our art better. Right. And it's that classic phrase that you can have failures in your life, but you are not a failure. No, at all. No. And and self-loathing is not cute. Definitely not. I've dated enough of those. I've been <laughs> enough of those. You know, I have. I'm a fat girl in musical theater. <laughs> Again, the body image is a lot. But as such, I let that tell me about the kind of performer I wanted to be. Mm-hmm. 
And I haven't been on a stage doing theater in a very, very long time. And yet I carry that hesitation with me onto Zoom screens and small platforms all the time. And guess what? The only person that's directing me anymore, I have no director. I am my director. And in this case, a lot of the time, the director can be a jerk. But I'm learning if I want people to take me seriously as an artist, if I want people to take me seriously as a creative, I have to take myself and the care of myself seriously first. Or no one is going to just rise up and go, oh, honey, you should eat. No, I'm 38 years old. I should know how to take care of myself by now and then forgive oh. myself for the times I fall down. Absolutely. That was beautifully, beautifully said, Annie. Mm, thank you. <laughs> so... I'm going to hop into your expertise, which mm -hmm. is selling, helping people sell. And I would, something, a conversation I've had with especially a lot of visual artists or people, I mean, honestly, every artist is an entrepreneur. Yes. And I think we can agree with that wholeheartedly. It doesn't Completely. matter if you're a musician, actor, visual artist with an Etsy shop or selling on the sidewalk, you're an entrepreneur. Why do you think artists and creatives suck at selling because we're very precious about the validation of our stuff and it can go both ways we're like i don't need anyone's input i'm self-validating and then on the flip side of that we're like please don't look at this please look at this please don't look at this please look at this right and it's because we see these things as of us if we were working in a factory perfectly lovely job. If we were working in a factory on an assembly line, we would look at the end product with a relative amount of pride. We will have been like, cool, I helped make this car or whatever. But we're not going to be like, this car is my being. <laughs> this car is my essence, right? And now we see these same creatives going out there and making beautiful graphics or art. Like I just went to Chicago Comic-Con and the amount of art there was just jaw-droppingly incredible. But those artists understand they don't have the luxury. If they want to print all those things and make their own custom washi tape, they're going to have to get out there and sell. So it comes down to, are you going to let preciousness lead you further into discomfort or are you going to let preciousness turn into pride and enthusiasm to get stuff out there if we treat it like a little baby bird of course we don't want to sell it this poem is my darkest moment made <laughs> manifest and you can buy it for 9.99 of course that doesn't feel great but if we're like, look, this book of poetry is a compendium that I worked really hard to put out into the world, and I am creating something new by adding my voice to the poetry market, then cool, then you're going to be excited. But if you're like, oh, let me share my art with you, <laughs> it, it doesn't translate as well because it means too much to us. Yeah, there's almost that there's that happy medium you have to find of putting enough value. Yeah. into it and believing in it and believing in yourself, that confidence, but then also not, as you said, putting so much value that it turns precious. Right. And it cannot leave you. Otherwise, a piece of your heart's being ripped out of your body. Right. I mean, there's a reason why fine artists charge an astronomical amount for originals. You only got one original. But y'all, most of the time, what you're selling is not the original. What you're selling is the copy, it's the stereograph, it's mm -hmm. the print, right? And so as such, do we need to be white knuckle death gripped on every single piece that makes up our body of work? We really don't. We mm -hmm. really don't. And then the other thing is we have love the one you're with syndrome. And I especially see this with performing artists. I'm sure it's true with creative artists and visual artists as well. But with performing artists, especially, there is this, this is the best show I will ever do. This is mm -hmm. it. This is it. And then you go into another show. This is the worst show I will ever do. Don't come. No, it's amazing. It's actually the best show <laughs> I will ever do. And then you're in the next show. That's the best show I will ever do. And it's like watching big hero six with an eight-year-old they're like this is my favorite part this is my favorite part this is my favorite part and it's like you're also diluting your audience 
when you're marketing every single thing you do with intense preciousness, then you give your business the feeling that we've all experienced with your improv friend who invites you to a show every single night of your life and you don't want to go, but eventually you feel like you have to out of duress because they keep asking you and you don't want to be a crappy friend. Right. Right. Don't do that with your business. Don't oversaturate your value so much by overinflating how great every single part is. Mm -hmm. Right. Every single print you make cannot be your magnum opus. And that is okay. Relax. At the end of the day, you are the artist and you are the creator. But good actors know who is acting for the audience. Who is art for? The receiver, the recipient, right? If we make it too much about us in performance, we call that masturbatory on stage, for lack of a better term, right? We're like, oh, my God, this guy thinks he's brilliant. Don't do that in your branding. But also at the same point, don't go out there and take your 15 seconds of fame and 15 seconds of attention and sing I Dreamed a Dream off key. You got 15 seconds. Do something good with it. Don't be cocky about it, but don't be shy about it either. If you show up genuinely confident, even if that confidence is a little shaky, you're an artist, figure it out. We can then sell that thing in a way that remembers that the art we're creating is not art we're creating just for creation's sake. It's art we're creating for consumption's sake. Mm, That's such a great point. Art we are creating for consumption's sake. That was um, one of my biggest frustrations about working in the theater world for so long was I really enjoyed the audience. The audience was this beautiful, mm-hmm. beautiful thing to me. And the audience is what every artist I know, every theater performer I know, like you would always hear it. They would start complaining if the house was small and they didn't feel that audience energy back at them. But then also the number of times I've heard the opposite of like the audience is the worst. Mm -hmm. They're not like the blame. And it's almost like this like weird give and take. And I was like, no, just there has to be that dual respect there. Yeah, because it's a parasitic relationship, not to call us all parasites. Yeah. But again, we're making art for consumption. Mm -hmm. We need each other. Theater is an audience driven platform. If a tree falls in the woods and it doesn't make a sound. Well, not if it's in a play and nobody goes to see it. (laughs) Right. But I also think you made a really gorgeous point about small audiences, because, yes, energetic transfer is a very real deal. And yet we also carry a lot of the kind of pomp and circumstance and whatever. If you went to art school, especially whatever (laughs) benchmarks or goals they tell you are really, really important for your career in that we carry that with us. Right. So like here in the Chicago art. Uh, and theater scene, we are all oddly obsessed with the Joseph Jefferson Awards, a.k.a. the Jeffs. There are Jeffs and there are equity Jeffs, and God knows why we're all obsessed with these damn Jeffs, okay? And what that happened now is that for the longest time, we're like, the Jeff committee's here. We might get nominated for a Jeff. I think this is really going to be my Jeff. Oh, you're going to get a Jeff. Oh, my God, a Jeff. We've made this big thing out of this award, right? And what happens now that I'm not in theater is I'm like, well, I don't know if I'm doing this right, so why don't I go apply for a whole bunch of high-profile awards because then that way I at least know if I'm winning or losing. Whoa! First of all, there is not a Jeff Award for sales coaching. And (laughs) if there was, it would probably be as rigged as the actual Jeff Awards. That's right. I said it. Yep. I don't know that any Jeff uh, reviewers listen to this podcast as of yet. As of yet. <laughs> Maybe I'll just like slip their card under their door or something. So you should listen. I'm not saying the people that win don't deserve to win. I'm just saying yes. the same people win over and over and over and over and over. Mm-hmm. It's true. Finding that right balance in your career is incredibly difficult as a creative. If you are lacking time, energy, or money to do the thing that you love, it might be time to figure out what needs to change. If you have no idea where to start, I encourage you to grab my free creative career audit. This worksheet will walk you through a process to help you identify what's bringing you joy in your work and what really needs to go. 
You can head to my website at www.victoriahines.com or grab the direct link in the show notes below. Alrighty, back to the show. So taking it back out of theater, how we kind of can get stuck in this preciousness. We struggle with selling. How can creatives kind of reframe selling Mm -hmm. that gives them that confidence back a little bit? You're problem solving with art. How phenomenally cool would that feel if you lurked? Because I define selling as problem solving for money. But selling as a creative is solving problems with art. Oh, my God, you freaking badass. I don't care if you have, you know, a mind that is your canvas or if you're writing a song or you're collaborating with someone. I don't care if the problem you're solving is that my wall is ugly and boring. It doesn't matter. You're solving something in me. If you're singing me a song, you are singing to my heart. You are delighting my brain. If you are making me a painting... You are brightening my home. You are bringing a piece of you into an environment that wasn't there. You are solving a problem with art. And therefore, you are applying your art to something bigger than you. And isn't that why all of us want to be artists in the first place? We're called to more. Musicians don't think they're the only musician. They want to be part of the cosmic chorus, right? So get in there and find out how you can solve problems with music or solve problems with coaching, or training, or painting, or teaching people to paint, or coding. Coding is a magnificent art. That right there is the closest one that you can see. This is an art form that solves a problem. I need to make this inchworm move. I do this, 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 and this in a creative way, and the inchworm moves. Solve the problem in a creative way, right? But we look at code and we go, well, that's a business. That's technology. Running an Etsy shop is freaking technology. Mm hmm. Having your own shop and website is technology. Drop shipping is technology. <laughs> yes. My God, I can't figure it out. And I've been in business for 11 years. <laughs> it's work, right? But, yeah. but again, you know, I see this a lot. Like I said, I was just at Chicago's Comic Con and I'm going again in a week or so from point of recording. And and it's just so amazing that those artists, there could be 95 paintings of spider-man let's just say spider-man right next Mm -hmm. to each other and those artists don't look at each other as competition they're not going my spider-man's not as good as my spider-man they're going my spider-man's on the toilet my spider-man's purple my (laughs) spider-man's glitter my spider-man's on a print material that you could crack over your knee and won't break like they know their place in the market but they also understand the problem that they're solving which is uniting fandom it's bigger than an art piece It's providing motivation, inspiration, fun, flair, and uniting fandom. They know that by making pop art, they're solving a problem. Mm. That's it. If you want to love selling, fall in love with the art of solving problems and solving problems with your art. Mic drop right there. Bing! All right, I got another big one for you. How do we avoid underselling? Ourself. Oh, so, something I think we, who as creatives, like, ooh, we fall into this trap so, 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 so much. This is why this is tough. In that, <laughs> this is why this is tough. No, this is tough for <laughs> myriad reasons, but like, we know what the market price on a croissant is. Yeah. Okay. Like, there may be croissants that are exorbitantly expensive. Like, there are cupcakes that are $10. And there are also cupcakes that are 50 cents at a little kid's lemonade stand down the street. Right? That's still not that big of a spam. Price gap. Yeah. Look at how much, or how little, I should say, a off-loop Corrine in the Chicago theater scene makes compared to Patti LuPone. Right? I mean, for the for people who don't know, it's it's... Thousands upon thousands of dollars a week. I oh, guess. yeah. Oh, oh, easy versus maybe you get a bus stipend when you're first starting out in Chicago, right? And so and that's okay. You got to pay your dues. But the challenging thing is in other industries, it's easier to do comparative analysis and competitive analysis when it comes to things like pricing because it's really hard. What is a painting? I don't know. This Banksy just sold for $2 million, but also... My kid drew something and I put it on the fridge and it's not worth anything, right? Like, how do we value art? 
And as such, because we don't know, we almost default very understandably and easily to like, well, I just want someone to pick me. So I'll slash my prices. I just want someone to pick me. So I will charge the least to make it easiest to buy. Hmm. Yikes. Especially in art. Now, I'm not saying that you have to make your stuff inaccessible. I think accessibility and pricing is important, but affordability Mm -hmm. is a myth, especially in art. Right? Is a $10,000 painting affordable? I don't know. I don't know your life. It's not for me. But also, it might be a good investment if I know that that's probably going to be worth a million dollars someday, then maybe it is a sound investment. I don't freaking know. Again, that's your life. But instead, if you're an artist and you're trying to sell to more than one person at a time or a creative and you're trying to sell to more than one person at a time, you want your stuff to be excessively priced. That does not mean bargain basement. (laughs) It does not mean bargain basement. We'll use theater again as an analogy here. Limited view seating is cheaper because it's limited freaking view. So all of us have had the experience we're bitches. I get it. Somebody gives us tickets to a concert or a show. We look at the ticket. We look at the seat or we look at the ticket and we look at the price point and we go, God, they couldn't have done something a little bit nicer. Like <laughs> I'm going to be behind a pole. Like what? We look at those experiences as lesser experiences of the same joy. Right. If I, um, for example, uh, Jesus Christ Superstar is playing downtown right now. So, like, I'll still hear it. It'll still be magnificent. But if I'm in the nosebleed, somehow that's not as good. Then don't charge nosebleed prices exclusively. You're then saying my show is only worthy to be seen from super far away, even if your show is a podcast, even if your show is coaching, right? We Mm -hmm. we devalue that. If I go in to a Barnes and Frickin' Noble... And there's a $40 hardcover gorgeous thing that I don't need that looks all fancy, fancy, but it's a book I love and already own. I'm going to be more tempted to splurge on that $40 leather bound Jane Eyre, even though I already own three Jane Eyres. than if I look over and there's a book that I was previously interested in, but it's in the bargain bin. Why is it in the bargain bin? Hmm. Must not have been good, huh? So right. I would rather overspend on something I don't need then underspend on something I potentially do that I have decided doesn't have the value I thought it did. That's why we have to be careful, right? That's why we have to be so, so careful because the goal is accessibility. But what happens instead is we wind up cheapening our value. So pricing is an experiment, y'all. The only (laughs) way to get used to it, the only way to see what sticks, and the only way to learn to embrace it is to make a choice. Yeah. Make a choice and test it and see exact same thing that stand up comics do. I don't know if this joke's going to land. You know what I'm going to do? I'm not going to call 20 people and ask them if that joke lands. I'm going to get up at an open mic. I'm going to say it. And then depending on how it's received, that'll tell if I tell the joke again, your pricing is the exact same way, right? I'm going to put this pricing out to five people. First, I'm going to see what questions they ask me about the pricing. I don't expect them to buy immediately anyway. Creativity is a relationship game, Mm -hmm. right? Or they're comparative shopping. I only got so much wall space. Why should I buy your X or Y, right? Mm -hmm. But all that being said, the route to getting and winning the comparison game is not to be the cheapest thing. We do not value the cheapest thing. So pick a price somewhere in the middle of where you're comfortable, put it out there and see how people respond to it. Yeah. That's it. I was also going to bring up how you said the where you are comfortable. Mm -hmm. I love, and I'm just going to brag on you. Like you're the one who taught me, ask yourself if that price is above or below your bar of resentment. Yes. And that's something I know you've asked me multiple times is it, especially with creative work. I think it's something you kind of have to do is start to figure out like, For instance, at one point, I was okay saying yes to a show where I got a $100 stipend for God knows how many hours of work. Mm -hmm. And that was fine for me. Yeah. Eventually, though, that was way below my bar of resentment. And I wasn't going to say yes anymore. No. Because it wasn't worth it to me. And I think, 
asking yourself that and continuing to ask yourself that, like that's part of the experiment as well. If somebody comes out tomorrow and is like, hey, do you want to play Fanny Bryce and Funny Girl, but we can't pay you? I'd be like, that's so high above my bar of resentment because that's bucket list. I don't care. Right. Mm -hmm. But most of the opportunities that we get in our day to day business are not necessarily bucket list opportunities. Right. Therefore, stop charging like they are. Stop charging like this is going to be the platform that that skyrockets you to household name status. It's probably not. And it's important because we all have really good and generous intentions. But sometimes clients are more expensive than the money they give you in terms of how much of a pain in the butt they are. And that's not me being mean to people. You know me. You're my friend. I am a lover mm -hmm. of people kind. However, doesn't mean I can't get taken advantage of. And also doesn't mean that good people don't ask too much of me when I ask too little of them in exchange. Mm -hmm. Are yep. they asking too much or did I ask for too little? The bar of resentment shows me that balance. Right. And. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's hard. Sometimes you're like, Shing, that's below my bar of resentment. You're not necessarily going to say that to a client who doesn't understand it. But you're like, listen, for the amount I'm showing up, that just doesn't feel right. And I feel like I won't be able to show up fully without a little bit of uh, feelings. Yep. Right. And so that's why. And also, yes, check in with how you feel. Check in with your bar of resentment. But beyond that, what you would spend on something is not a good indicator of what your prices should be because you don't have the problem that your art is solving. Ooh. Right? So That's it's a, a little bit of a well, dance, yeah. right? I don't want people to mishear the bar of resentment as just price your stuff what you would pay. That's not what we're talking about. We're mm -hmm. talking about pricing stuff in relationship to where it feels like a fair and even energetic exchange that you get to do what you're being paid to do not have to do what you're being paid to do that being said if you are a visual artist who has no wall space in your loft or your home you're probably not going to turn around and buy a 300 dollars original painting if you are a hairstylist, you probably have a friend who's in the industry that does your hair and you do their hair and you exchange it. And you're probably not going to pay $300 to go to a salon and get your hair partially highlighted. That doesn't mean other people won't. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean other people don't. Right? Mm -hmm. So I don't need sales counseling. I need a whole lot of things. But would I pay $1,500 for my own program? No. Because I don't need it. Because you don't need it. Yep. But did I painstakingly come to that price point based on my bar of resentment, what's comparatively and competitively available, and what I think would be an investment but not a painful one for my people? Yes. Did a whole lot of research go into that? Yes. Would I give myself $1,500 tomorrow? Hell no. <laughs> I'm, I'm worth it, but I don't need it. <laughs> absolutely all right annie i could keep talking to you all night but i'm gonna wrap this little podcast up so wrap it up wrap it up wrap it up my last question for you was what advice would you give to an artist who is looking to feel more confident in their career get out there and charge Ooh. you don't know what people will pay you until you ask them to pay you. Like I said, about pricing being an experiment and just sticking it and seeing nothing makes you feel more legitimate than getting one. Yes. Just one. Yes. You may have to go through a bunch of no's, just like auditioning, just like trying to get into a conservatory, just like all the stuff we're used to, but just <laughs> get out there and charge and get that first sale to show yourself. Number one, if you're making money, then you're a professional artist. What up? I don't care how much you're making. Number two, you've monetized your art. What up? I don't care how much you're making. But then you can go and you go, you know what? This is bigger than me. Someone wants what I can provide. So then I'll just keep showing up. If not for me, I will show up and create for them. That's normally the easiest gateway. In freaking credible. All right, Annie, how can we keep in touch with you? All right. If you want my loud, weird voice in your ears <laughs> weekly, check out my podcast, Too Legitimate to Quit. It sits on the intersection of art, 
pop culture and business. So if you love those three things, you will really love my show. Too Legitimate to Quit is available on every podcast player, and you can also find it at twolegitimate.com. Amazing. And I'll definitely drop that link in the show notes below. Thank you, Annie, for being on the show. Every moment in your presence is always a joy. Thank you for having me. <gasps> oh, I feel blessed. Yay! Isn't Annie P. Ruggles one of the most incredible people in the world? I'm so glad she hopped on my show this week. All right. Let's get to it. Here's your one thing. I want you to get out there and charge. Set yourself the goal to get one yes. And in the words of Annie P. Ruggles, nothing makes you feel more legitimate than getting that yes. If you're stuck on ideas on how to put yourself out there and what to go after to get your yes, feel free to send me a message on Instagram and we can chat about it. All right. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. And until the next time... Stay creative.